Welcome to Next Round with the Pacific Research Institute. I'm your host, Rowena Ichon. One of the most popular podcasts ever was with New York writer and aspiring comedian Sarah Rose Siskin. Well, Sarah's father, Larry Siskin, a prominent Bay Area attorney and PRI board member, got a bit competitive and thought he could top Sarah's audience size. So in this podcast, we have father and daughter, Siskin versus Siskin, Boomer versus Millennial, New York versus California, Urban versus Suburban, to discuss the issues of the day. Tim and I, PRI's Director of Communications, and I chat with the Siskins on everything from climate change, the presidential race, the march of technology, the meaning of work and sacrifice, and even the American dream. It's one of our best. Thanks for joining us. So let's start with uh, climate change. Um, A lot of news was made recently when Greta Thunberg issued a generational call to action on climate change at the UN. She got a lot of pushback from conservatives who basically just called her a a little kid. What do you make of young Greta's call to action? Was it unfair to dismiss her words as youthful hyperbole? And is there a generational divide over how we view the climate change debate? Sarah, why don't you go first? So I think that Greta Thunberg, like a lot of public figures, is famous because she embodies an emotion. And I think for her, that emotion is exasperation. You know, and frankly, like I feel exasperated too. So I kind of like I understand her call to action. Um, I'm probably exasperated for maybe slightly different reasons. You know, I think that we need better by and nonpartisan research about climate change to kind of clear the air about what actions are best to take subsequently. And libertarians and conservatives agree that public action problems require public action solutions and you know climate change is a public action problem like at its core so I think there's actually a lot more room for agreement than disagreement about the issue and America's shown in the past that wise judicious regulations can actually seriously help the climate like the banning of CFCs actually closed the hole in the ozone layer I was really surprised to read this recently because climate change sort of hysterical people don't ever talk about the, the positive gains but the like existential crisis of my youth which was the hole in the ozone layer is actually like closed up recently due to like you know banning of cfc's so i mean there's we can work together to pass positive regulations that actually help things and you know i think it does require calls to action like like greta's i think that uh, there is a difference in how generations view climate change i think that younger generations millennials included view it less politically in earlier generations there was debates about whether it even existed and then the debate became like how man-made is it and now the question is like okay well how much can we do about it so i think it's less political than it used to be larry Well, speaking for all the curmudgeons, you know, I will happily embrace the role of curmudgeon here and and say that in the New Testament, if I can get religious for a minute, Jesus says, suffer little children to come unto me. I think Jesus would have made an exemption for Greta Thunberg because I found her literally insufferable. Look, climate change is real, it's at least partly due to human activity, and we do need to take it seriously and come up with practical, fiscally responsible solutions. Uh, But it won't help the world if the U.S. spends itself into bankruptcy. In other words, we need input from grown-ups to solve this problem. That means people have gone to school, people have graduated, gotten jobs, earned money, and paid taxes. Uh, Young Miss Thunberg hasn't done any of those things, and yet she has the gall to tell people who don't share her sense of imminent doom that they are evil. And let's personalize this for a minute. I mean, what gives this privileged girl the right to tell some West Virginian miner who's trying to support his family and who may lose his job and his way of life that he's evil for disagreeing with her? And by the way, that West Virginian may very well lose his job. Uh, it may have, may come to that, but that doesn't make him evil. And that's that kind of language, that kind of approach, I find literally insufferable. But I'm not sure there's a generational divide here because I'm not sure Greta Thunberg speaks for her generation. Frankly, I think she's being used by people of my generation to advance their interests and their, their arguments. It's, it's something we see in the gun control debate where older people use children to advance their arguments because children will argue you passionately because that's what children do. Uh, And then if someone like me or some other curmudgeon questions their qualifications to opine, 
why men were attacked for picking on children. It's a, a cynical approach, uh, but it's effective. So another generational divide seems to be housing. And you always think of older generations rushing to buy the traditional home with the white picket fence as soon as they were able to do so. In recent years, you're seeing younger generations far more likely to be renters or embracing urban living and large high-rise buildings, even when raising a family. So we're going to put that vision to the test with both of you. So what's your vision of your dream home? Maybe you already have it. And what do you think that vision says about your political outlook? Maybe we'll start with Larry on this one. Well, let me start by talking about the house Sarah grew up in. Uh, <laughs> it didn't have a white picket fence, but it, it had a brick wall, which I built myself when I was uh, going through my Churchill phase. Churchill <laughs> He used to build brick walls when he was out of power. So you're one up on Trump on wall building, Dad. (laughs) (laughs) Well, this didn't keep anyone out. And Sarah's sisters, Sarah wasn't born yet when when I built this, but her sisters helped, as did her mother. Uh, I didn't have servants to help the way Churchill did. But here's one area where I think... Sarah's generation has a right to take my generation to task. I mean, I, my wife and I deduct our mortgage interest payment on our house. Now, that deduction has become uh, more limited, but it's still a great deduction for people my age. Sarah and her peers, for the most part, rent. And so they pay their rent with after-tax dollars. And in effect, they're subsidizing people like me and Sarah's mother. Uh, but the real problem, I think, is not just tax policy. It's also the fact that housing is in short supply, especially in popular places like the Bay Area, which is why Sarah is 3,000 miles away. We recently sold the house with the brick wall that I was describing for about eight times what we paid for it. And why? Well, we did that because housing is short in short supply here. There are environmental regulations which limit areas uh, in which home construction is allowed. Uh, there are other limitations. And people from both generations support those limitations. So I'm not going to take all the blame. Some of it is Sarah's fault, not personal. But <laughs> a lot of it is Greta Thunberg, too. Let's <laughs> not forget about Greta. Okay, got it. Yeah, we're yeah. going to be blaming her repeatedly. My God, Dad, what happened to you in your childhood that makes you hate this little girl so much? <laughs> You know, I I have to take a moment to recover from my father admitting blame for something because I that was a curveball I wasn't ex- expecting. And it's ironic that the thing that he would take blame for is like the thing that I probably care the least about. I don't have a dream home. I have dream locations. I I love living in New York City. I love the Bay Area. I love traveling. But you know, my work is remote. My company actually is is in Hong Kong that I work for, and I can I can actually work from wherever. So I don't grieve the loss of. Uh, the American dream home with the white picket fence and or brick wall. The thing actually I, I'm realizing from the previous question is like to some extent seeing natural disasters on TV have kind of subtly influenced how I think about homes. Like it's kind of terrifying to see people so attached to their homes that when storms go through their area, they you know, they talk about it like it's, uh, you know, it's a generational loss, like how many generations of their family inhabited the same place. To me, that seems like kind of a scary and big investment that seems perplexing almost to me. And the only thing that for me that really concerns me about housing, frankly, is uh, school districts. That's really the where the rubber hits the road for me on like, when I would actually start caring about where to get a home. I still think it's ridiculous how public school system works and how you'd have to pick based off of the district you're in. So that's the only place where I guess I really care about about housing. Every child has heard their parents and grandparents talk about working three jobs to put food on the table or walking five miles to get to school or or in my dad's case he liked to tell us that during wartime he just got an orange for Christmas. Now we're seeing millennials reject sacrifice sacrifices, even demanding free college and, and basic income. What are your thoughts on this apparent shift in work ethic among the different generations? Larry, why don't you go first? This is a wonderful question. I really like <laughs> it. 
because it allows me to recount in this public forum that when I was in law school during the great blizzard of 1978, when all of Boston was shut down, I had to walk not five miles through the snow to school, but 6.5 miles. And I know that because uh, while you were talking, Rowena, I measured it. I, I got on Google Maps <laughs> and put in the addresses. So I'm quite familiar with hardship. Now, in those pre-email days, um, I was actually able to work my way through college and law school as a messenger, because that's how law firms delivered messages from each other. They didn't have email. So if something had to reach them that day, they, they used messengers who physically walked them around. And by doing that and working full-time during the summers and with scholarships and loans, I could basically pay my own way. Derek cannot, because the cost of education has gone up so much since then. It's, ri it's risen I think eight times faster than uh, than wages in the last uh, generation. But the solution is not to demand free college. I think that's absurd because nothing is free. If students or their parents don't pay for college, it's because the college cost is being paid for by someone else, meaning by other taxpayers. You know, and as a, as a practical matter, since wealthier people tend to go to college in higher percentages than less wealthy people, it means that the lower classes are subsidizing the middle and upper classes. So free college is really a regressive idea. The solution that we have to look for, I think, is to expose college to the same kind of market forces that other goods and services are. And it's not exposed today. I mean, why is the price of computer power going down every year and the price of college education not only going up, but going up much faster than everything else? Your father says it was pretty expensive to educate you. Are, are you at all concerned about what it's going to take to educate your own children? Well, yeah, just to add on for what my dad's saying about his six and a half miles in the snow story. Yeah, um, I'm sure the Neanderthals worked a lot harder than the Homo sapiens. I'm sure the hunter-gatherers worked a lot harder than the farmers. <laughs> Like, there are some technological advances that, yeah, they make life easier, um, that maybe less pun punitive parenting, perhaps. But I think that, like, there's there's a parable about hard work that I kind of like. That It's not even a parable. It's actually a true story. Talking to a tech recruiter who said that he likes to go into startups and uh, ask, who's your laziest employee who hasn't been fired? And they'll often point to the desk of some, some uh, man or woman that that recruiter will then hire. Because his thinking is if this person is getting all their work done and then is spending the rest of the day playing video games on their computer then they're working smarter and not harder and I really believe in that I believe in working smarter and not harder I don't believe in working for work's sake I think that that sort of false puritanical ethos is why in the Great Depression there were jobs created that were pretty much digging holes and filling holes I think that what you're actually doing in your job matters a lot and I, I count myself frankly lucky to be part of a generation that maybe places a higher premium on the meaning of their work uh, than on just menial work so that's just like one note about work but then I also kind of want to bust a couple of like myths about baby boomers who for some reason inexplicable to me like always confuse themselves with the greatest generation so I had found some quotes online about baby boomers that I liked one of them is it's a generation who insisted that a passion for living should replace working for one, a generation of spoiled brats that have been raised uh, in conditions of unparalleled excuse me, liberty, peace and prosperity in the stable two-parent families created by the greatest generation. And that was from the very liberal bleeding heart guy named PJ O'Rourke that you guys might know in his book, The Baby Boom, how it got that way and why it wasn't my fault and I'll never do it again. So <laughs> with that said, I think the baby boom can be like kind of hypocritical about how much work they actually put in. Uh, this is the generation of the counterculture 60s. So let's be real when we're talking about work ethic. We're also talking about the millennial generation that's building startups that's forming culture nowadays. So yeah, the question ticked off some of 
emotions about work ethics in different generations. But the second part of your question was about free college and basic income. I kind of basically agree with everything my dad said about free college. I do agree that it's kind of like a regressive tax in some ways. And like to add on even one further point, uh, right now I was surprised to see that this is the highest percentage of low income students going to college. It's 20% of uh, college uh, admitted pools now are low income that require uh, financial aid. So that's that's pretty cool. I mean, it sucks that college is so expensive, but I don't think making it free, quote unquote, is going to help anything. One note on the basic income idea. I actually think that's interesting, to be honest. There was a uh, another sort of bleeding heart socialist who advocated for the basic income, and that was Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman, who uh, who advocated for the um, negative income tax. So I don't think it's like as crazy an idea for libertarians and conservatives to consider. Uh, Andrew Yang's the one who's been talking about it uh, a lot in the presidential elections, uh, presidential debates. I don't think it's an idea worth considering, but it would have to go hand in hand with dismantling sort of aid bureaucracies. And I don't know if we're actually up to that task. Before we get to the next question, can I make one brief rejoinder? Please do. Here we go. Is it about Greta Thunberg? (laughs) <laughs> no, I'm not going to mention Greta. I was going to re- uh, respond to your comment about the uh, Neanderthals. Uh-huh. And From the perspective of the Neanderthals? To, during my walk through the snow, <laughs> there, were, there were no Neanderthals because the mastodons had chased them all away. <laughs> So kind of staying on this theme of work and the future, polling shows that Americans, really young and old alike, are stressed out about the future of work amid all of this economic disruption we're seeing with tech innovation and artificial intelligence. Now, inevitably, and we're already seeing it, you know, there are calls for the government to, quote, do something about a big issue like this. So what do you think government should do, if anything, to address this disruption? that is fundamentally transforming how people are working and living. Maybe we start with Sarah on this one. Sure. I I mean, I got a dog in the fight, to be clear. I work for an AI company in Hong Kong. So um, I I think what the government can do is allow it. (laughs) I think the technological transformations that uh, AI is sort of prompting are great for the most part. I think what people misunderstand about automation is that robots and AI are automating literally the most dangerous, the most menial, the most boring jobs uh, out there. And these are jobs that you can free humanity up to do things it's actually better at, which is innovating, designing systems, and frankly benefiting from the lower prices of consumer electronics and other consumer goods that automation provides. So I think it's generally a force for good, and people make much of this type of argument, but the same thing with like uh, carriage drivers reacting to the invention of the car. It always looks like, oh, there's going to be mass unemployment until you the next disruption happens. And then there's a huge market for robot manicurists or whatever is next in the world. So I actually I'm quite optimistic about automation. And one of the things that I, I think people should understand is that robots and automation and tech is it's not there to com- compete with humanity. It, it's there to complete humanity. Well, I'm in favor of artificial intelligence also. I, I too have a dog in the fight. It pays Sarah a good living that allows her to afford to travel home from time to time. <laughs> where I can or not continue, just talk about it. <laughs> where I can continue the daunting task of trying to educate her. Uh, I, on this issue, I think we fundamentally agree. The thing that the government ought to do about this issue is, is nothing. Let the economy develop as it will. Uh, and I agree, the tech innovation nearly always ends up creating more jobs than it reduces. I'm going to revert to my curmudgeon role here and recount the days when um, when I started working. If, if I wanted to deposit a paycheck, I went into the bank, I stood in line and met with a teller. Uh, now we have ATM. And when ATMs were first being incorporated in banks, people said, well, that's going to destroy a lot of tellers jobs. Mm. But, you know, it's had the exact opposite effect. And why? It's because with ATMs, it's less 
less expensive for banks to build more branches. So they're building branches everywhere. You build more branches, you need more tellers. So ironically, ATMs, which were feared to eliminate teller jobs, have ended up creating more of them. And you can come up with lots of examples like that. Uh, the internet was supposed to end people's interest in buying newspapers or eliminate jobs like I had in college as a messenger, because now we have email. But what actually happened was the internet created millions of new jobs that didn't exist before. We have whole industries, not just AI, but um, web design, data scientists, uh, online marketers. With AI, people are concerned it will eliminate translator jobs because artificial intelligence can translate foreign languages. But, you know, think about it. If you break down the language barrier, you're going to make it easier for American companies uh, to do business abroad, which is going to create more jobs. So not only because it provides work for my daughter, but for sound economic reasons, I think the government should stay out of the economy and let technology develop as it will. So uh, staying with the issue of tech, it, it seems like young people embrace the latest technology trends immediately, while older people are still struggling struggling to uh, move beyond you know, their AOL email addresses. With all of the recent data breaches and political censorship by social media companies, are you rethinking how much you trust tech in your daily life? Uh, do you have any qualms about willfully giving up your private data online? You can start with Sarah here. So yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. There's like all these questions, there's a lot of um, questions involved in it. So I'll tackle the first premise, which is that young people are always ahead of the curve. And this is actually surprisingly not always the case. There is high adoption rates in younger people, uh, younger consumers, but often they can be fads. And there are some things that older consumers are interested in that can drive the market. And I actually have a personal example. Many years ago, I mercilessly made fun of my parents for using text dictation because they would stop in the middle of a conversation to talk very loudly and specifically into their phones uh, in order to dictate a text. And I just thought this looked so old school and dumb. But that actually is extremely important software that in the past three years has hugely expanded in its usage. More people are speaking into their phones and has become extremely important for companies like my company, for Siri, for a Alexa um, for any uh, at-home assistant. Uh, and that was something first adopted by uh, older consumers. So you know, the, the trends aren't always that the younger people are the first to adopt. The second thing about sort of privacy, like, okay, yeah, it's a big issue that I think about. I was trying to download some app that would let me add filters, photos, and in order to download it, they were asking for like my banking information and social security number. And I was thinking, why does this company need that information just so I can make this photo look slightly more vintage. It, it, it's excessive, I guess, it's, to some extent, but like to make a, a sort of more nuanced point, the information keeps a lot of these applications free. And to be kind of maybe like pragmatical about all this, I or pragmatic, I trust companies with my information more than I trust the government, and they may not be different. So that is to say, like, I like having targeted ads. I'm tired of getting Viagra ads. I like having ads targeted for you know, 27 year old women. I sometimes actually follow their suggestions. Uh, so I, I like that. Um, I I don't think it's great targeting right now. Like I've noticed, you know, I have a friend who bought a lawnmower and then continued to receive lawnmower ads for like three months. And what ad company thinks when somebody buys one lawnmower, mower, they're gonna start like a spree. So it still needs like, it still has little uh, kinks to work out. That said, it's better to get ads that are targeted for you. It keeps the internet free. What's scary to me, though, is when the companies potentially give your information to the government, because that's where you start to get things get dicey. There isn't a whole lot of evidence about what the government is doing uh, with the information. The NSA has significantly reduced its power since the Snowden whistleblowing. But that said, they still do have access to a lot of information. And while some people don't understand why this is scary, Edward Snowden had a good metaphor about it. He said, it's sort of like somebody putting a gun to your head. And when you say, could you remove the gun, they would respond, well, I'm not pulling the trigger, so what's the problem? And that's kind of how I feel about the potential of the government using sensitive cyber information. Rowena, your question asked about 
people struggling to move, move beyond their AOL email addresses, uh, I'm happy to announce I stopped using AOL years ago <laughs> and moved on to Gmail. And my resolution for the next year is to learn how to use my Facebook account, which one of Sarah's sisters set up for me and manage it because I've never figured out how it works. And I'm Not really your, as you like to refer to it, your MyFace account. <laughs> 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 and one quick yeah, anecdote. <laughs> I have one of those too. Dad, my father, by the way, just to give some context, he asked me once to FaceTime him photos, which was his word for FaceTime, which is his idea of what airdrop is. So <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of translation. There's a lot of leaps there. there. Yeah. Yeah. So this is what we have artificial intelligence for. So we, can <laughs> translate. we can translate dad speak into language that even a daughter can understand. Look, I, I welcome innovation that improves products, but I, I don't favor or change just for the sake of change. I grew up in a home that had a uh, General Electric refrigerator that was built in the 1950s, and it worked and worked and worked. And it was there until my parents sold that house in the 1990s. And as far as I know, the buyers are probably still using that the damn thing because it, it was just built to last forever. Sarah's mother and I just bought a, a new house uh, about two months ago. The house was built in 2014, so it's only five years old. Has all new appliances. And guess what? Since we've moved in, we've had to replace or repair the dryer, the stove, the refrigerator, the wine cooler, because we're Californians, we have a wine cooler, uh, and the garbage disposal, which I repaired myself. This so is I why like you should rent. That, I like things that are built to last, and I'm skeptical of some of the latest technology, because so much of it seems to be built to be updated and to be updated soon. Mm -hmm. As to the private, for the privacy issue in data, again, to, to help with my modernization, Sarah bought my wife and me an Alexa uh, for our house, and we're very careful what to say in front of her because we know that Alexa is listening, and we know she's passing on our secrets to Amazon. I think the solution is to be selective in the data that you allow big tech to know about. Uh, so what I've done is I've trained our Alexa to say, if you ask our Alexa who should be president, uh, <laughs> it will say Lauren should be president. Lauren should be president because of his compassion and his faith in the common man. And I've also trained Alexa to say that Sarah loves her father more than life itself. <laughs> so that's how I think you, you deal with, with uh, privacy and, and uh, big tech. You give it what you think it ought to have and no more. So Amazon now has all this important in information uh, about me, and I, I just hope they use it wisely. Kind of on the subject of tech and economic uncertainty, you know, we're seeing on the presidential campaign trail a real surge in popularity among surprisingly young people for democratic socialism, as they call it, and the programs being offered by candidates like Bernie Sanders. But it kind of doesn't make sense because you're seeing a lot of young people flocking to support the oldest candidate uh, in the race. I think he's the oldest. I'm not sure with Biden and pretty old if he's not the oldest. So are we really to believe that a 78-year-old Marxist who just survived a heart attack is really the top presidential choice of younger voters? Maybe, Sarah, we could start with you on that one. Well, I think you're being a little ageist, Tim. I am. Uh. I, I'll admit it. <laughs> Um, I think that anybody of any color, at any age, of any gender, can be a absolutely ridiculously stupid Marxist. <laughs> um, no, I mean, my thoughts about Bernie Sanders, he's, he's the Trump of the left. I think he's a populist, and I think young people like him because we, are, we were raised in the internet, which is a hotbed of irony, and he's a really sincere, genuine person who honestly believes his own bullshit. And sort of like Trump. He, you know, it doesn't make any sense, but you get the feeling that he really believes it. And, you know, it cuts across even politicians I, I somewhat admire, like Ron Paul. Like, a lot of young people like Ron Paul because he comes across as really authentic. And I think there's something charming about the fact that millennials respect candidates who have overarching ideological systems that actually explain their positions, as opposed to candidates like Obama or uh, Joe Biden or uh, Mitch McConnell 
McConnell, who don't seem to have like ideological structures so much as just political pragmatism. And I think this kind of also just explains why young people tend to like Warren over Biden, why yeah, any sort of preferences for the youth, I feel like, steers towards the ideologically honest. I think the reason young people are attracted to socialism, and by the way, the polls show that uh, the youngest voters find socialism preferable to capitalism, which is a frightening thought. But I think the reason they're attracted to socialism is because they don't know what socialism is. Um, young people of Sarah's age um, were not alive during the Cold War, and they never saw the grayness of socialism. They never saw people who risked their lives, and, and many who lost their lives, trying to escape from the socialist Soviet bloc into the capitalist West. And you know, that's why I, I've written in my blog about the HBO series Chernobyl, which I thought was so valuable, not just because of what it had to say about the mismanagement of nuclear power by a socialist government, but because of its very accurate portrayal of the, the fundamental tawdriness of life under socialism. Another reason I think young people support socialism is because they have something other than socialism in mind when they refer to it. If you ask them what they mean by socialism, they'll talk about plastic. It means to be super extroverted, right? And go to a lot of parties. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a socialist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's about the level of young people today. Now, they, they think of something very similar to that, but different. It means there shouldn't be people who are too poor or too rich. Everyone should be nice, and when they're through going to the parties, they should have a society that's like Denmark, which always comes up as the example of a nice socialist society. But in fact, Denmark has a market economy, and if you ask the Danes whether they're socialists, they'll, they'll be offended. Socialism, of course, government ownership of the means of production. And I don't know of any young people who, when presented with that fact, will say they favor government ownership of Google or Amazon. They may not be happy with those uh, companies, but when push comes to shove, they may be worried about having Amazon in their kitchen with Alexa, but they certainly don't want the government in their kitchen. So uh, staying on the theme of the presidential campaign, the Democratic presidential field faces some youthful candidates like Mayor Pete Buttigieg and, and Andrew Yang. Both have untraditional profiles and, and platforms for presidential candidates. Do you think their appeal is a testament to the growing political strength of millennials, at least among Democrats? Or is there some other factor that explains their support? What do you think, Sarah? Well, I think it's kind of like what I was saying before. I think that it has to do with like both Andrew Yang and Buttigieg seem to have ideological structures that kind of explain their system of beliefs. Um, I think that Buttigieg is kind of, I say this, like usually I use this word as an insult, but I don't mean it in this case. He's a little bit more of a technocrat. Like he sees structural changes in government that could be made. And I actually really admire that because there's something ideologically pure and ambitious about it, about his reforms like the Electoral College and the Supreme Court. I think 2016 made a lot of millennials start to question aspects of the system about how we elect officials that I think Buttigieg is sort of satisfying that feeling. And, you know, he has a personal tie to this stuff. He talks about how his ability to marry his partner was one person decided that on the Supreme Court federally. And it's a little bit crazy to think about it when he sort of deconstructs it that way. So I think like that's kind of appealing, his ambitiousness, his his critiques of the system, and then his personal tie to it. I think with Andrew Yang, it's, it's, very, it's also similar. Presidents are good at like agenda setting. I'm not sure how much they can actually affect change, to be honest, but they are good at getting the nation talking about one thing or another. And Andrew Yang is talking about issues nobody's talked about before. The loss of manufacturing being due to automation and how do we whole scale change uh, our opinion, our like, you know, our economic structures. Because while it's easy enough for me and my dad to say like the government should just let this revolution, this fourth industrial revolution take place, uh, we've got like a lot of subsidies and uh, a lot of sort of dis distorted capitalist structures that that support our current system. So I think Andrew Yang's like talking about um, important themes that young people are interested in. So I think that, yeah, both
both of them have a sort of an honesty and like an authenticity to them that's appealing. And unlike Elizabeth Warren, I feel like they have better plans for actually to how to pay for this stuff. And unlike uh, Bernie Sanders, of course, too. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it has less to do with millennials being attracted to other young people just for the sake of being young. Because like, as your previous question showed, they like Bernie Sanders too. I think the millennial support for Yang and Buttigieg has more to do with their like ideological systems that are consistent and then their personal ties to them. Well, Rowena, I'm going to have to start by questioning your premise. I'm not sure Andrew Yang has the kind of growing appeal you mentioned in your question. I've been keeping tabs with a real clear politic poll, which is a collection of polls, and he seems to be pretty well stuck at about 2%. So if he has growing appeal, it's a well-hidden kind of uh, appeal. From what I can tell about the Democratic Party millennials, and by the way, I'm not, I haven't been admitted in, in, into membership in that group. Oh yeah, your letter's in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for not blackballing me. They don't have a favorite yet. I expect that their support will eventually coalesce around whoever they think has the best chance of beating Donald Trump, which is their main interest in the campaign. And that could be a young candidate like Mayor Pete or Andrew Yang. But I don't think age is determinative. If Biden or Warren or even Sanders pulls ahead, I think he or she will get millennial support, even though they're all in, in their 70s. Having said all that, though, I do want to make a prediction. I think that as the Democratic race narrows, I think that millennials will gravitate around Pete Buttigieg, and uh, partly for the reasons that Sarah talked about. It has, has nothing to do with his age, even though at 37 he's the youngest candidate. Ironically, it's the opposite, because he's the most grown-up of the candidates. He acts and he speaks like a grown-up, and his life is what I think millennials expect of a grown-up. He's married, he goes to church, he has a real job where he's actually responsible for running a city, which is the kind of job where you have to show results. And when you watch him speak, Speak. When you watch him in the debates, there's a maturity in him that I think is lacking in the other candidates. So I expect, or I would not be surprised, if when the primary shakeout candidates, millennials coalesce around uh, Pete Buttigieg, because he is their picture of what a grown-up is supposed to look and sound like. Our last question on the presidential race. Uh, we're seeing uh, Elizabeth Warren has zoomed to the top of the polls on the Democratic side, and much much of the energy behind her candidacy, you could argue, is centered around the notion, and it was also advanced by Hillary Clinton during her campaign, that it's, quote, time to elect a woman president. So what do you think? How does gender play a role in deciding who America's next president will be? And maybe you can put your prognosticator hats on. How do you think a female president might govern differently than a male, and what America inevitably elects its first female president, whether in 2020 or down the road, what's your prediction for who she will be? Let's start with Sarah. There's so many. I love this question. Um, there's a lot to answer. I think I'll go with like the last part of the question first, which is who I predict it will be. Sort of like past results would indicate that the first female president is going to be a Republican. Uh, and I say that just because if you look at any great empire or country that has elected its first female leader, uh, they're usually from the conservative party. So like you got Indira Gandhi, you got Margaret Thatcher, you got Golda Meir. Uh, so I would say it's probably uh, going to be a Republican. With that in mind, I don't think it'll be 2012. I think it'll be 2024 and my prediction for who it'll be is Nikki Haley because I think she has incredible bipartisan support managed to survive the Trump administration somehow untarnished which is just miraculous and so uh, I'm, I'm excited to see uh, her run. As for your other questions about uh, how might a female president govern differently than a male, I actually think that women have the equality and the strength and the wisdom to be just as terrible as male leaders. I think like if you look at the history of uh, female leaders, you look at Catherine the Great or Elizabeth the First, they're just as martial and warlike as their male contemporaries. Uh, same thing with Golda Meir, Margaret Thatcher, and Indira Gandhi. All of them, you know, had major wars under their belts. So I don't think that like, you know, a lot of people say we could solve world war if we have a woman uh, elected president. I don't think that's the case. I think 
the why I would be frankly excited to have a woman president, why I think it would be kind of cool, is not because I have any great expectations that her administration would be different or better for women. Like, for example, I, I personally don't think Barack Obama, what any of the regulations he passed or agenda he set was actually good for African Americans. I think if anything, it's actually kind of somewhat bad. But uh, I think his marginal benefit and a female president's marginal benefit would be the inspiration to young people when they pick what they want to do with their lives. I think, you know, Barack Obama definitely empowered a lot of African Americans in this country in a really kind of wonderful, heartwarming, inspiring way. And I think the female president would do the same as like a figurehead of state. So I think that would be cool. And yeah, Nikki Haley, 2024. Yeah, I think America's definitely ready for a woman president. And I think uh, Rowena and Tim, you both know we have the perfect candidate at the PRI. Her name is Sally Pipe. Yes. She would make yes. a fantastic president with a one minor problem that would have to amend. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. We'd have to amend the Constitution because Article 2 requires uh, that the president be a citizen, a uh, natural born uh, American. Maybe we could uh, just Sally. annex Canada. Well, Sally's from We've Canada. Tried it before. But I, I see the possibility of forming a coalition between woke Democrats and libertarian Republicans uh, to agree on amending the Constitution so Sally can become president. Uh, sort of like Lafayette's line in Hamilton, uh, immigrants, they get the job done. I'm sure uh, Sally would get the job done. But if we can't get the Constitution amended in time, uh, then I too would uh, happily settle on Nikki Haley as the first woman president. Um, I just hope that after we elect our first woman president, we put gender to the side, and it's not even an issue when we elect our second woman president. Well, uh, we're nearing the end, and I think this is a, an appropriate question. Um, Americans have always clung to the notion of achieving the American dream as a goal that makes all their hard work and sacrifice worthwhile. Politics is much more polarized today. There are clearly different worldviews of what the American dream is. As we close, we'd like to ask each of you to answer this fundamental question. What does achieving the American dream look like to you? Dad, you want to take this one? Oh, so I get to go first for a change? I, I noticed a certain pattern here. <laughs> Just trying to give you a leg up. <laughs> All right, so this is this is the PRI's version of affirmative action. <laughs> let the dad go first for once. I I think this is a great question, and I'm glad you included it, Rowena. Um, I, I think that first we have to recognize that for many young people, the phrase American dream is something of an oxymoron because they're indoctrinated with the idea that America is bad. It's not a place for dreams. It's a place for nightmares. Uh, we've been talking about the, the candidates for president. Well, one Democratic presidential candidate um, recently said, and I'm quoting, America was founded on racism still racist today. And and I think that's the message uh, that young people, particularly at our universities, get today. And it's filtering out to the culture at large. You get a flavor of that from the New York Times um, recent Sunday magazine, what they call the 1619 Project, uh, whose main point seems to be that the country was born not in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence, but in 1619 with the arrival of the first slaves. Uh, you know, 1619 was certainly an important year, and we should never forget what a stain slavery was uh, on this nation. But slavery and all those other isms that are dwelled upon in academia, they're not what make America unique. Uh, they're not what make the phrase American dream feel real today. What makes America unique is our commitment to the freedom and dignity of the individual. And ironically, for a nation that, according to the universities and the New York Times, is, is built on colonialism and oppression, this is where most of the oppressed people in the world still want to come. They want to come here so badly that they risk their lives crossing rivers and oceans and deserts to do so. So I believe that there's something uniquely good 
about the country that accounts for the existence of the phrase American Dream. And so I believe there's something um, uniquely good about this country and that accounts for the very existence of the phrase the American Dream. And I guess which also explains why we never speak of the Chinese Dream or the Russian Dream or even the French or British Dream. I think achieving the American Dream still exists. It means setting your own, goal, your own goals and accomplishing them, or at least accomplishing as many of them as you can. And it means doing so on your merits, on your ability as an individual and not as a member of some group. To me, that's what the American dream is about, the exaltation of the freedom and dignity of the individual. Is that better, Dad? <laughs> Good. I, I, I was worried there. There was that long silence. I, I, I don't know what office you're running for, but you have my vote, Dad. Okay. <laughs> I should not have watched the debate. Yeah, you're very... I'm just imagining the uh, the gesturing that goes with the speech. Okay, so um, I think that's a very good answer. I, I do think that I, I took the answer a little bit more in the direction of uh, the freedom aspect than the American aspect. But for me, the American dream is just... It means to have the political, economic, and social freedom uh, to do what makes you happy. And so I guess what I mean by political freedom is that the government doesn't stand in your way. Economic freedom doesn't necessarily mean that you're entitled to the capital, but you have access to capital um, if you earn it. And then the last is like social freedom, which is something that I think is less talked about, but it has to do with like um, tolerance of different ideas. And I think that is fundamentally an American virtue, not exclusive to America necessarily, but because we actually borrowed the, the concept from John Locke's uh, essay, a Letter Considering Toleration, which and he's, what is he, Scottish or British? Well, British of some stripe. Anyway, so I think there's political, economic, and social freedoms at hand. Um, and I think we, we do imbibe that in America. And I actually have an anecdote of what the American dream means to me that is somewhat um, risque. So recently I went to Burning Man and I went with a friend from uh, the South. I think she's from Atlanta. And she had never been to a place like Burning Man before and was quite bowled over by it, uh, frankly. And one day we we're walking down the street and she uh, passed by a, uh, a stand offering free public spankings. And I had not known this about my friend, but she had a strong desire to be panked spanked in public and so she very joyfully uh, waited in line uh, went to the front and then when her turn came with tears in her eyes of joy that is I hope uh, was spanked publicly and the crowd was so happy for her they started applauding at her joy at this freedom that she didn't even know it was it was accessible to her and looking at this scene I do remember it being indelibly marked into my brain that this is the American dream <laughs> <laughs> so finally, when you two pick up this conversation in person, hopefully over the holidays this year, what adult or otherwise beverage do you recommend that our listeners should try when they are arguing or discussing politics at the next family or holiday gathering? Can I be allowed to nominate two beverages? Please. Okay. Um, first, in my Democratic with a small d uh, nomination, I'm going to mention a beverage I served to a guest who was at our house last weekend, um, a gentleman named Clark Judge, whom uh, you all know. And Clark and his lovely wife, Margot, and my lovely wife and I had spent the day playing tourists. We were all thirsty. And I brought him back to the house and gave him a Budweiser beer, which is what I <laughs> And he liked it a lot, or at least he told me he liked it. <laughs> Hasn't kicked me off the board yet. Um, in my more sophisticated uh, tone, um, I'd recommend Tears of Your Own at Tequila. And first, full, <laughs> hey. full disclosure, I have a small percentage of the company. I bought into this company because I like the product so much. And uh, second disclosure, Tears of Urona is spelled with an LL, not a Y. <laughs> if you look for it with a Y, you'll never find it. And this is not your college tequila. This is a very high-end product. It's an extra extra uh, Anijo tequila made uh, from 100% uh, 
blue agaves. And um, it's aged in three different barrels, barrels that hold scotch, sherry, and brandy. And it's very, very good. It's like a cognac or a brandy more than, than a tequila. Great with cheese, um, great with a cigar, which I like to do. Do not use it with ice cubes and certainly don't mix any, um, any uh, soda or other drinks in it. It's got to be um, imbibed uh, purely. And Sarah has tried some, and I dare say she'll agree with me that it's, it's, uh, it's a good beverage. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've, cheers to that. I very much agree. Uh, in keeping with my dad's um, sort of shoehorning things in there, I'll also recommend two beverages. Uh, the beverage will depend on the severity of the debate you're having around the table. Um, the first beverage uh, I would recommend is uh, Laphroaig Scotch. And I recommend it because it's always been my favorite scotch. And I liked it ever since I was uh, drinking it in as a freshman in college. College. And I always wondered why an 18-year-old girl's favorite alcohol of choice would be, like, the one of the peatiest uh, scotches available. And then, um, and it sort of dogged me as a mystery for most of my life. Why do I love this scotch so much? Uh, what is it about it? And then I realized a couple of years ago, the reason I love it so much, and I, I have such an emotional attachment to it, is because it smells very familiar to me. And it smells very familiar because... Uh, it was what my dad would drink when he would read me bedtime stories and eat peanuts uh, and put me to bed. And so that's why I have a very sort of warm emotional attachment to Laphroaig. Uh, I, I'm guessing number 12, year 12, Dad, if I'm checking my facts. Well, if I had had a good week, it would be 18. Okay, got it. <laughs> Um, so that's if the debate is uh, is not so severe. If the uh, if the Thanksgiving debate is sort of uh, roaring, if you're in Denver or Oakland, I strongly recommend the uh, decriminalized magic mushrooms that are widely available for a, a much spicier evening. Lafroix's one of my favorites too, but I haven't <laughs> tried the magic mushrooms yet. <laughs> thanks so much, everyone. Yeah, thanks for having me. Special thanks to our guests, Sarah Rose Siskin and Larry Siskin, and to my colleague, Tim Anaya. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to our podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Itchon. We hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.